If you wanna run stainless steel passes like these ones here, these are gonna require some precision and a really stable arc. After doing many different welding projects over the years and teaching people how to do this, I've got some really awesome tips that are gonna to help to get you results like these ones here. Let's go. One of the toughest things that people complain about when they first start learning is a wobbly or unstable puddle, as well as keeping the line on the edge of the weld completely straight and consistent. When I've been able to get my setup completely dialed for the best accuracy, I'm able to do some pretty thin stuff. And I can actually focus my arc in even tighter to get some even tinier welds. Let's go over the first thing that's gonna help you out with this. And this is going to be focusing on your starts. The start is going to be the most crucial part to every weld. This is going to determine absolutely every aspect that is going to follow as you move away from the start. I've always talked about on my channel as far as the start being the most important part of every weld that you do. If we start out with a pass where the start has been a little bit under established at the beginning or a little shaky or whatever, or perhaps the start has a little bit of an imbalance between the heat and the filler material that's being used. Everything that's gonna follow this area is gonna be a pretty tough situation to get a hold of. We want everything established and controlled perfectly right at the beginning before moving. Then essentially, once we start moving, everything that we need to do has already been done at that point. Take a look at this example here of this start. We can see the beginning of this lap joint. Everything has been established with perfect size and profile for the most part. We don't see any overfilling, we don't see any overheating. The amount of heat and filler look pretty good in relation to the material that we are welding here. We can see by looking at the footage here, look at how much time I'm taking at the start. I'm giving things a decent amount of filler to completely fill up the profile. And I'm also making sure that I give adequate heat. Looking at it again, if I take a few extra seconds for things to stabilize, but then once everything is good, I am good to go, off I go. What is typical is somebody's gonna start up their pass. They're gonna experience a little bit of turbulence. The puddle's gonna be wobbling all over the place. Essentially what is happening here is that this is a puddle that has not established properly before somebody tries to start moving it. All it takes is a little bit of extra time at the beginning, a little bit of extra attention to detail. We wanna take an extra moment to make sure that the filler material settles down completely and that the profile of the weld that we are establishing is exactly the size and shape that we want before moving. Typically what I do when I start up each weld, I start up and give it a good amount of heat right away and I get filler material in almost immediately. Giving things a little bit of extra filler at the start is going to help prevent things from overheating. Within reason now, calm down. But what this is going to do is heat up filler material instead of the base material. This will buy you a few extra seconds that you can then hang out. A little bit of extra filler, a little bit of extra time hanging out at the start before moving. What do we call this on my channel here? If you're feeling brave, pause the video, put the answer in the comments below. The thinking behind the start, no matter which joint you are doing, when you flash up your arc to start your pass, we are going to fill and chill. As I said, giving things a little bit of extra filler right off the bat is gonna buy you a few extra seconds that you can hang out and let things establish. As long as you aren't getting into an amperage range, which is essentially excessive for the material thickness that you are using, it's gonna be completely fine for you to hang out a few extra seconds and let things establish. Whether you are doing a super huge long pass or doing some pretty thin stuff like this outside corner work here, honestly, it doesn't matter. A little bit of filler and a little bit of extra time to allow things to stabilize so that you can control them at the start. The philosophy of what I teach is essentially all of the important work that we need to do is done in this area at the start here. Like I said, at this point, once we start moving away from the beginning, all we have left to do is just babysit what we started. Okay, so essentially, that is definitely the most important part, obviously, because it is the start. But the next most important thing that is gonna help to get you really good control of your arc is tungsten preparation. Now, this little buddy here, this is the tungsten electrode. Typically, when I'm setting up my machine for stainless steel welding, I'm gonna set the machine up with the lowest start amps available. You can see on my Everlast here, I have things set up at the lowest setting that I can get away with at the start. This will be my minimum amperage on the foot pedal. And with a properly prepared tungsten, this arc is gonna flash up really efficiently and very accurately. We don't want the arc wandering around at all. We want it to lock on and establish to exactly where we are aiming. Especially with a joint like this, where you're working with relatively thin stainless steel material, if your arc is wandering around or it's locking onto one side more than the other side, this is going to completely screw up your joint real good. 
So with the machine programmed with really low starting amps, let's talk about how I prepare my tungstens. For starters, I don't care what you're using, just make sure it is clean, please. Don't use anything that you kind of dipped just a little bit. Sometimes when my students are having problems with getting good starts, I take a look at their tungstens and they look like this. <clears throat> Gross. Whatever preparation you put on your tungsten, make sure it is brand new and absolutely spotless clean, please. These things need to be ground properly. Now, hear me out. A lot of people assume that they need a really fancy custom tungsten grinder or something like that to do this properly. I have been welding for over 20 years now and do you wanna hear something really crazy? I do not even own one of these things. I've tried them a few times, they're super fun, they're really easy to use, they work great. But as long as you know what you need out of a proper tungsten preparation, you can get away with preparing your tungsten with a belt sander or dare I say, even an angle grinder. Ooh. Here are some things that you need to consider if you're preparing your tungsten using a belt sander or even an angle grinder, whatever. Whatever you use as far as a belt or abrasive, it has to be clean. The belt on this belt sander is specifically used only for grinding my tungstens, literally nothing else. This belt is relatively new and it can do a really nice job of preparing my tungstens. Doing it on a belt sander or whatever it is that you are using, just make sure that the grinding directions are going lengthwise to the tungsten. If you start doing things a little bit sideways like this, this is what is called radial grinding. Even the slightest bit of a diagonal grinding direction. You're gonna notice that at low amperage, when you start up especially, your arc is not going to be as accurate. And like we just talked about, what's the most important part of every weld? The starts. If you're taking time to practice what we talked about with getting perfect starts, combine it with a perfectly prepared tungsten. This is what's gonna help you to get the best results with accuracy and arc control. Now, I keep talking about this joint here. This is relatively thin material. When we arc up to start welding on something like this, we want our accuracy to be perfect. This way we can keep our heat input and the actual size of our welding relatively small and focused. And if we are doing exercises where we are starting to learn how to properly penetrate the material we are working on, we really need to make sure that we get this heat focused in exactly to the area that we need it to be. Whatever you're using to grind your tungsten, just make sure that the grinding marks that you are making are relatively fine. Again, I think the belt on my belt sander is like 220 grit or something like that. And when I'm using the drill to spin these down so I can grind them on this belt, I'm pressing relatively light. I'm hardly pressing at all. I'm basically just letting it kind of grind on its own, work itself down. And these grinding marks are gonna turn out really fine. Now, as far as the length of the taper that I am grinding on my tungsten, a good rule of thumb that I typically teach people in my online program is that this area will be two times the diameter of your tungsten. For example, if you're using a 3 32nd of an inch tungsten like I am using here, the length of the taper will be approximately 3 16 of an inch or so. Now, if you wanna get really silly with the best results out of your grinding to your tungsten, let's get silly. What you do here is get one of these. This is a 3M Scotch-Brite grinding pad. You can just place it on your table like this and then of course, wearing all of your safety gear, spin your tungsten over this pad with a drill. Even though you may notice that I am spinning this over the grinding pad with a radial direction, the abrasive isn't actually coarse enough to put any real grinding marks in the tungsten surface at all. It only takes a few seconds. Again, I'm hardly pressing down at all on this, but you can see looking at the final results here, things turned out pretty smooth. The grinding marks from whatever method you use to grind the tungsten down are removed a fair bit. And like we said, everything that we were looking for is as smooth as it can be. Typically, a lot of people assume that a certain type of tungsten is what's gonna get them the best accuracy. I use these ones here from CK Worldwide. These are the laser tungstens. I usually find that these things snap up and arc on really smoothly and they have pretty good control at low amperage particularly. Again, everybody has their favorite as far as what they prefer using. Just do some research, see what works best for the machine you are using. Now, this next setting might be a recommendation that not a lot of people actually assume has anything to do with accuracy. However, when you get to a more high level of joint configurations and different projects that you're looking to take on, this is absolutely something that is going to help your accuracy a lot. And this is going to be your gas settings. That's right, the settings that you use for a gas level coming out of your torch are going to play a part in helping your puddle remain more stable and your arc remaining more accurate. Honestly, you might probably not notice this at all working on flat joints or flat practice exercises and stuff like that, but on more precarious joints and shapes going around profiles of stuff like that, 
you absolutely will notice that your puddle is going to be pushed around and lose accuracy much easier on that stuff. Now this typically happens when somebody's gas setting has been set too high. Honestly, this doesn't really matter what size cup you're using. If the gas flow running through it is excessive, going around corners or profiles like this, you are going to notice all of a sudden that your puddle out of nowhere is becoming unstable. If you're experiencing problems with this going around profiles or shapes on projects like this, I recommend dialing your gas back just a little bit. And having your gas setting too low won't really have much to do with your accuracy at all. But as you dial your gas settings down too low, obviously you can have problems with inadequate gas flow, which can cause oxidization. That's a whole different type of problem. But as far as keeping good accuracy to your welding, especially going around shapes and profiles, make sure that your gas is not set too high. The volume of gas, especially with stainless steel, I find changes drastically in relation to what size cup you are using. If you are using a small cup, like a number six or a number eight or something like that, you will obviously want to set your gas value for much less. Smaller cups like this will be more prone to having problems with excessive gas flow running through it, simply because obviously the cup opening is much smaller. A gas value that worked perfectly for a number 10 or a number 12 cup, I think especially when you're welding around shapes or profiles, you're gonna notice that with something like a number six or a number eight settings with this same gas flow rate, all of a sudden the puddle is going to become unstable. I use these cups here, these are from Edge Welding. Honestly, I've been using them forever and I actually used them way before I was even sponsored by them. Typically when I'm welding reactive metals, I like using something like a number 15 size cup. And most of the time, I'm typically gonna be running somewhere around 35 CFH. This seems to be a good sweet spot for this size of cup. Having a larger cup diameter obviously spreads the gas out a little more evenly. And going around welding profiles and more difficult shapes, you're gonna notice that the stability is much better with a cup like this. These are things that you can do to make small adjustments with your setup or settings that can potentially pay off really big for your stability or your control of your arc. If you want to take a free class on TIG welding stainless steel from me, check out the class that I released specifically on TIG welding stainless steel online. This is going to be a complete breakdown of the basic stuff with TIG welding stainless steel. Again, that class is completely free to register for. Go check it out. And do a random act of kindness for a stranger today. My name is Dusty. Phil and Chill. We'll talk soon. Peace.